we went to the Snyder Trophy seaplanes and that was a natural progression from that to very fast flying aircraft which of course finally resulted in the Spitfire and its successors. It gave us a lot of experience with high speed flight. That was extremely important. The Spitfire was not an S6B without the floats. It was a completely a new design. The S6B fuselage was all metal and the Spitfire fuselage was all metal. And incidentally, it's not generally realized, I think, that it was the first all metal fighter which went into service with the RAF. The general impression which people have is that the Merlin engine was developed from the Rolls-Royce R engine which won the Snyder Trophy. It wasn't. The engine which was developed from the Rolls-Royce R engine was the Griffin engine, which came in a lot later. Mitchell had ideas of his own and went ahead as a private venture. And Vickers gave permission for 12 months work, I think it was 12 months work and £100,000 to um, design and build the prototype with the proviso that if we hadn't finished it in 12 months and if we'd spent more than £100,000 they chopped it. But the Ministry came along about halfway between, halfway through and uh, said we like the look of it and produced an order for the, the actual prototype aircraft. In other words, they did pay for it. The, the prototype Spitfire K5054 was more or less hand-built. But uh, at that stage, we had no facilities for dealing with large-scale production, and they had to be put in uh, in order to get to the, the situation which we did have when the war started and throughout the war. The Spitfire was revolutionary in that respect. Uh, it, its construction was, was very different than many things that Supermarine had done previously. And that took a long time to actually get to grips with and turn it from an engineer's or a designer's dream into a, a viable production aircraft. Because when it was originally manufactured or designed, nobody envisaged that they'd make 22,000 of them. It was never envisaged. It was a very radical change in two ways. One, of course, it was a different uh, type of uh, aircraft altogether. But the other thing is that the first order which we got for Spitfire production, 310 aircraft, which totaled more than the total number of aircraft that the company had ever built. There were a lot of structural changes pointing towards the uh, possibility of large-scale production. For instance, the skins of that you know, double curved the leading edge of the wing were a tremendous problem because all that sort of work had been done by hand by sheet metal workers, you know, rolling pieces of metal between rollers and they were absolute past masters at it. But you couldn't do that for, you know, if you're going to produce, what did we produce, something like 40 a week. When you see the, the plan form of the aeroplane, it's probably the wing that makes it very distinctive, very recognisable, and which was achieved really by, as we always say, there's not really one straight line on a Spitfire anywhere, a uh, fuse large tail, and especially it's true of the wing. The, the wing of a Spitfire was a very complex shape. The need for that was brought about by the fact that Mitchell was very keen on the idea of a thin wing, and so the design people had to produce that and accommodate the uh, undercarriage and the guns and the ammunition boxes within those constraints. It was state of the art at the time, in fact it was ahead of, it was ahead of the game. Um, it was a brilliant concept, it did everything it was supposed to do because that is what a good design is all about, achieving what it's supposed to achieve with the minimum cost and the minimum effort and that wing certainly did that. Although it was difficult to produce, at the end of the day it was an extremely good wing and it didn't change, really, until uh, right through the Spitfire range of, of aircraft, through the Griffin engines, it didn't really change until we came to the laminar flow wing on the Spitefall in, in the late 1940s. Uh, well, the main challenge to us on wings over the years has really been spars. I mean, the, the strength, the secret of the, probably the Spitfire wing's success um, because of the, the actual depth between the spars is only sort of a few inches. The Hurricane, for example, is twice the thickness. 
um, which made it very, very you know, streamlined for, for the time. And I've got a small offcut here of one that we've made fairly recently where you can actually see the interlocking five different size tubes with the inch and a half bar in the middle, which when bent then locks the six degree dihedron in place. And this is prior to us after having made the thing going off a heat treatment. Um, but that gives you some idea of, and it's, it works in a, in a very effective way. Um, and really, I suppose that was the most innovative thing about the, the wing design, as far as we're concerned. Um, the technology of the 1930s sort of leapt forward with this, with this design, and I suppose that re is really the secret of the wing success. Quantum jump comes when you get the Spitfire, and you know, side by side, the, the wing thickness is about a third on a Spitfire than what it is on a Hurricane. The wing also, despite the fact that you can't actually get it there because there's not sufficient power, is aerodynamically valid beyond the speed of sound. So yes, I mean, that plus the combination of the very low frontal area and the fact that if you put more power on it you will go faster, then the Spitfire, certainly in terms of British aviation, was the quantum jump. Well, a stress skin construction is essentially a form of construction where you have an outer shell which is made of riveted up panels, frames that support that outer shell, um, a multiplicity of frames. In the fuselage, for example, we have got 19 frames from the engine bay back to where the tailplane joins the aircraft. And then joining those frames together, there are stringers. And the whole assembly is riveted together, and the, the skin, along with the stringers and the frames, take the load. As a, that is opposed to the traditional type of construction where you had a tubular construction and uh, maybe a canvas uh, covering on the outside. So the covering on the outside took no uh, part in providing strength to the aircraft. That was done solely by the tube construction. The nature of the, of the structure of the Spitfire was probably fairly typical, if you like, of sort of 1930s, probably the English-British way of thinking about making parts. Count the parts in this rib, you'll probably come to 25, 30 separate pieces. The contemporary German aeroplane at the time, the Messerschmitt 109, would have just been a one-piece pressing. They'd have just made a great big press tool and, 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 and knocked it out on a big press. Um, they seem to concentrate really on the tooling aspect of it and not much labour as an element, whereas we seem to be in the mindset we had obviously plenty of labour available and all these little tiny detail parts were made all over the factory and then assembled finally and, and we seem to have used 20 people to make one rib where the Germans and perhaps later the Americans when the Mustang went into production really had it almost on, a, on an assembly line thing um, which later became the norm of course but the Spitfire never did I mean they were made like this from 1936 to really for the next 10 years a lot of it was subcontracted. In fact, but finally, all the submarine did was to put the bits together. Very nearly the whole thing was subcontracted. It could never have been done uh, without that. The uh, Spitfire was unique. It was unique because most low-wing monoplanes uh, behave perfectly in the air. But many of the low-wing monoplanes, when you came into land, depending on your load configuration, would be a little bit tricky on the actual touchdown due to the flow from the wings over the empennage. But the uh, Spitfire, by virtue of its wing, the little twist in the wing, the flow over the empennage, you could load that under. You could land that under any conditions with a high angle of attack or a three-point landing, and. Uh, Unless a silly thing like a camera door on the root end of the starboard wing was open, it would put down absolutely perfectly. Now, the first time I flew the, uh, the Spitfire, to me it was straight away, it's a thoroughbred. It was the most delightful aeroplane to fly. You didn't get in it, you strapped it on. Uh, and, and it was a friendly aeroplane, wouldn't let you down and no, no nasty habits whatsoever. Didn't drop a wing. I got into spin in a cloud one day, trying to be clever, and uh, I came out and there was the earth. I thought, oh God, it shouldn't be there, you know, straight down. And I took corrective action, and a single-seater fighter, high-powered, it came out just like that, just like that. And I did a lot of stupid things in a Spitfire, 
because I was rather stupid, a bit, bit precocious, I suppose, and uh, it got me out of them every time. I felt about the Spitfire that it was a beautiful aeroplane, that it flew very nicely, it was quite fast, and there was a good chance that uh, in that you could uh, shoot down some enemy aircraft. There was also quite a good chance, if you learnt to fly it properly, that you could evade them shooting you down. Um, it was, oh, I don't know, I, I, you felt a sense of joy at flying the Spitfire. Opening up the throttle of the Spitfire was like a kick in the back. It was really, you could really feel the boost. And they were nice and light and easy to fly, except they had this pump action, getting the wheels up, getting the flaps up. You could always tell the uh, newcomers at the place by watching the airfield, the aircraft going round the circuit, sort of leapfrogging as people tried to pump the flaps up or down, ready for the landing. It was the thrill that everybody who's ever flown a Spitfire expected to be. It was, uh, after flying Xenomers, you would find speeds like 300 on the clock and this sort of thing. I mean, it, and here was an, uh, an aircraft at the slightest touch would do what you asked to do. I taxied out past the Spitfire up on its nose and took off. Bloody marvellous. You felt you'd been flying it all your, all your bloody life. Lovely to fly, but it had two disadvantages. Well, one disadvantage, which one could see in two, two different occasions. One was that if you tried to pull up after you'd landed, because you were short of runway, or grass, whatever it was, many people tipped up in the nose because the centre of gravity was so near the wheels. The other thing was that you couldn't see straight ahead on the ground at all. And people happened to collide with other people. <laughs> and in the air, the disadvantage was that you really couldn't, if you, if you had to take a deflection shot of anything like uh, 15 degrees or more, you wouldn't be seeing, if you were taking a correct shot, you wouldn't be seeing your target at all. With the spit, you had limited time in which to taxi. You couldn't bugger about, because the radiators were underneath the wing, and they're completely blocked off from the, the actual air flows. I can also remember, almost with resignation, taxiing out to downwind and turning into wind and thinking, well, there's no excuse now. I might just as well get going. And I opened the throttle and the acceleration was something I'd never experienced. Um, and the next thing I knew, that, uh, the thing had leapt into the air with sort of me hanging on to it. You felt a part of the machine and you felt in charge. You know, it's like the first time I drove an Austin Mini it was the first time I really felt in charge of a motor car. Same sort of feeling. It was all, all mine. It fitted me, it worked well, and so it went on. I loved it. If bombers were on their own, of course you'd attack the bombers, as they were occasionally. Uh, but if they're, they're, they are being escorted, you, you, if you try to get the bombers, you'd surely get shot down yourself. You see, because they would see you, they'd have the advantage. You have to slow up the bombers, so you had to get the fighters first. Our instructions were to look after the ME 109s, not go for the bombers. That was our firm instructions. In fact, we flew 20 hours on Spitfires. I think it was 20 hours on Spitfires before we went to a squadron. And that doesn't give you very much time to do much more than become accustomed to the aircraft. And even then, you, you, you are not fully able to take advantage of all its, all its abilities. Um, and you... Every time you fly it, you experiment in it in a different way. 
I say things were very different to Lakenfield. In those days, we used to be called at uh, 3.30 in the morning, breakfast at 4, uh, when you really, really feel like having breakfast, and then it was down to dispersal. And if you were still there at 8 o'clock in, in the morning, a second breakfast arrived. That was the breakfast I really enjoyed, in the open air, mostly in sunshine. Eggs, bacon, sausages, mushrooms, coffee, everything. And it was in fact going to stand me in very good stead because uh, after I was shot down, uh, I was taken to Ramsgate Hospital, which had been terribly badly bombed, and all they could produce while I was there was a slice of bread and butter and a cup of tea. And uh, I was not going to get another meal until 36 hours later. I could always see dawn red in it. I can see the Spitfire standing in the gloom at dispersal. Uh, I can hear the, the airmen and the clank of petrol bars. And, uh, you know, and, and I can remember sort of uh, looking up at the sky and thinking, oh, it's going to be a lovely day again. Oh, God, another dawn, you know. Said a little prayer. Um, it's going to be a very busy day, or not? If I forget you, don't forget me. Just give me this day. Please, give me this day. Well, depends on what sort of redness you would got. Our usual redness was sort of 30 minutes and um, this meant that people had got their parachutes already on the aircraft. If it was mine it would be ha hanging off the um, port wing. All he did was scramble base 12 and we were out of that door and, and you know, out the bloody way quickly you know. And outside you would hear the flight sergeant say, right, start up, start up, and all the way down the perimeter track, air screws would turn. And by the time you got to your Spitfire, it was the engine was running, the fitter was looking at you from the cockpit. It used to go on the port wing, which is just as well, because you walk up and under it, grab the two straps, pull away, the fellow on your back, bit came round to here, you click, click, bit bent down, Strap between your legs and then click, click, and you're finished. Ten seconds, you're on, you're on your way back to get in. As soon as you've got it on and we're walking around the trailing edge of the wing towards the cop, he'd get out of the cockpit quicker than that and sort of lift you onto the wing, almost put you in the damned cockpit. And standing already on the other side was the your, your, your rigger, and they would help you on the strap. Now we used to scan the, the sky quite a lot because in those days, you remember, it was um, three Vic formation. And in, those, in, in a Vic formation, you can't take your eyes off the leader very much. <laughs> Otherwise, there's going to be a collision. So we used to keep our eyes over there and up there and in the mirror. I looked ahead and there was this massive aircraft, again like Nats on a summer evening with 109s above, and I'd never seen so many of them. And Brian and I were underneath them, we're climbing up for a head-on attack, and you know, I, I, I sat there and I thought, well, what the hell do I do now? Where do you start on this lot? Well, the first thing, Jeff, is to turn your gun button to fire, because if you don't, it won't go bang. And I, I did that and I tightened my straps. I can feel it. Got down behind the armor plate of glass and the armor. And we went straight into them. The one thing you always needed if you were going to survive was speed. Because when you were tapped, you went into a tight turn, which immediately made your speed drop virtually to nil. They stalled, if the bullets were whistling around. So then you had to get speed. And the only way was to 
dive down in a spiral to get the speed up, even if you climb back up again. So you needed speed. Without speed, um, you were at loss. The gun sight that we had in the Hurricane and the Spitfire, the first Spitfires, believe it or not, had ring and bead, even in the First World War. But then we had the reflector sight, which was really a, 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 a more up-to-date uh, pr presentation of the ring and bead. But uh, people couldn't hit anything as a result of deflection shooting to save their cells. And the only way to, to hit anything is to get directly behind the headshot as close as you possibly can. Close your eyes and fire. Uh, it, it's very little more than that. You should see him turn inside and you'll always be able to turn inside more quickly than the Hun. And uh, get up uh, higher, he must be higher, and then preferably in, in the sun, as far as he was concerned. And if you were attacked, once, once the bullets flew, get out of it. <laughs> get out of the way, I should say. Not get out of it, get out of the way. August 26, when yellow sections scrambled, drove over to Dungeness at Angels 20. Just the three of us. It was myself, Jack Mortis Norman, uh, who was leading us, uh, Sergeant Ridley, and myself. And uh, we hadn't been patrolling for very long, and we were absolutely we bounced by the whole squadron of 109s. And as soon as you try to turn to one, there's about two on your tail. Tennis Norbin was terribly badly burnt, but he survived, uh, although he, he returned to fire, but was killed later in the war. Sergeant Ridley was killed, and I got a bullet in my leg, and my plane was shot to pieces, and I had to bail out. And uh, I tried to jump. I hope the hood tried to jump but uh, I was still plugged into the radio. So I had to try it also. And, and I jumped, it sort of pulled me back. So I uh, took my helmet off and then fell out. And I wasn't taking any chances. I pulled the cord straight away, even at 20,000 feet. And it took ages and ages and ages to come down. Well, I can only go on what people who did it for real say, and being reasonably familiar with both types, I think I can support what they say, and what they say is, if you believe that today is going to be a picnic, you will be there in superior numbers, and you're going to have a good time, you want to look good, do it in a Spitfire. If you think the odds are stacked against you, it's all going to be terribly bloody, and you don't want to be there, do it in a hurricane. And the reason for that is that well, a lot of people don't realise Hurricane will actually outperform Spitfires, 109s, anything you want to name at certain bits of the envelope, much more restricted bits of the envelope than a Spitfire. But it is no mean fighter. It is a much better gun platform in that it's much more stable than a Spitfire. But I think most, most pertinently, a Hurricane will absorb much more punishment and still make it back. And that is the reason that guys say, you know, on a bad day, go in a hurricane. Under Joe's guidance, the weight of the airplane more or less doubled, the engine power doubled, um, its speed went up by nearly 50% and other aspects of performance improved, a rate of roll, a rate of climb, and things like that, all uh, improved, because they had to. I mean, we had to keep in front of the enemy all the time. So many people ask me, what, what, what was your favorite Spitfire? I say straight away, and it, it just depends what you want me to use it for. Is it for firepower, is it for performance, or for handling? And for handling, I would have thought, the Mark V with the 24 pound boost engine with that aircraft it's the only Spitfire that I flew that you could take off almost from the tarmac in less than 200 yards 
pull it up as if going for a, a loop and at the top of the loop be able to do a slow roll and then continue upwards to 5,000 feet before you started your show. And that aircraft could be flown at the top of the loop before you started to commence the, the roll at 15 to 20 miles an hour below its normal stalling speed with the 24 pound boost and providing you kept the aircraft absolutely positively between negative and positive G. If you put too much G on, positive G, you'd flick. If you didn't have a, enough of the other, the engine would obviously cut and the same thing would apply. It was a little bit tricky, but it was the only aircraft that I ever flew, only Spitfire I ever flew, that could do that. I actually got a lot of time for the Hurricane. It is a truly wonderful aeroplane, but for one reason and another, mainly because it is an early 30s design and the Spitfire represented the quantum leap in aerodynamics, then I think anybody who really flies these sort of aeroplanes would have to prefer a Spitfire. That said, we have got the only Mark II flying in the world, which is also the only aeroplane which fought in and survived the Battle of Britain. That aeroplane is, of course, historically priceless and indeed very pleasant to fly, but it has got some minor handling faults, which are very early Spitfires had. We've also got a Mark V, which for my money represents the best of the breed in that you have got increased power. They've sorted out the minor handling difficulties that the very early Marks had, but they haven't started to add lots of armament, lots of fuel, and therefore make it heavy, which is what you actually end up with as soon as you move to the Griffin Spitfires. So yeah, for my money, the Mark V is um, as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. The Spitfire Mark VIII was designed as the, uh, the first of the considerably strengthened wings. The Spitfire Mark IX was an interim version, uh, which was uh, designed to go into production quickly. But it didn't have the stronger wing. Now, Castle Bromwich, which started making the Spitfire Mark IX, said, we don't want anything to do with this Mark VIII. You know, go away, we'll make Mark IX. And so there were an awful lot of Spitfire Mark IX. Mark IX was still the Spitfire, aileron controls, elevators, and what have you the same as all the previous models, virtually speaking. But you see, with the aircraft below the Mark IX, you peaked your power variably with engines, but let's say you peaked your power at, at, at 15,000 feet. And from then on, your power was diminishing the higher you got, which uh, against the uh, FW190 and the, uh, the Messerschmitt 109, they had the power ups upstairs and of course their performance was better and uh, it was only when the Merlin was fitted with this two-stage blower so that instead of losing your power let's say 15,000 feet or above it carried on with another st stage blower which although it, I think it took 300 horsepower itself to drive the, the blower gave it far more power than any Spitfire had previously had and that's why it came as, a, as such a shock to the Germans that when they were intercepting at, say, any height above 20,000 feet, the performance of the Mark IX was equal or if not better to theirs. And of course, uh, they got a tremendous shock. It came down to how much experience the squadron had. Uh, we all started off with uh, deck landing problems. That was a, a major thing about the Seafowl, was it had a very delicate undercarriage compared with what we'd been used to. Uh, it was um, uh, likely built up to a point. Uh, you, you, if you landed too fast, you were likely to pull the, the hook out of the fuselage, or bend it anyway. But uh, it was a magnificent aeroplane in the air, and if you could gather enough experience, then it was a first-class fighting weapon, even on a carrier. But um, one still has to train people, and it's quite an expensive process losing aircraft while well, you are training them. The 19 was the last wartime variant. Um, and they then went on to the Mark 24. But really, the refinements after the 19 are purely in terms of a little bit more horsepower, but not a lot, 
a bit more armament, but not a lot. Um, a little bit of aerodynamic refinement in terms of how you fare the undercarriage in and that sort of thing. I think they did it, largely speaking, because it was obviously a very successful fighter and until the advent of the jets there was nothing that could seriously replace it. Because of the availability of Spitfire engineering drawings, and a lot of the Spitfire is available on engineering drawings, not all of it, um, and the experience built up, you really need no more than a data plate now. Merlin engines seem to have popped out of the woodwork. Um, the, the, there's very few parts on the Spitfire that can't be made in using relatively simple tools. Um, it was an aircraft designed to be made on a kitchen table. With what we do nowadays, I think provenance is probably, certainly from the owner's point of view, and we would have to agree with that, is the single most important part. When an aircraft arrives with us, it has to have a credible identity, traceability um, and history. I mean, without that, you've got nothing. Uh, when I say data plate, I suppose um, really what you're talking about is the soul of the aeroplane. Now, for me, when an aircraft has buried itself in the ground, the soul has been destroyed, especially if it's killed someone. Um, I would never, ever buy an aircraft project that had killed someone because I believe that, you know, in a primitive way, you've lost the soul of the aircraft and it's just nothing. Um, so I think, for me, and this is a very personal opinion because I know others disagree, that I would need to know that the aircraft had substantially survived, even in very rotten condition. Um, and you have to remember that these aeroplanes, like cars, I mean, they never perhaps survived throughout the years that they did um, without having parts changed. You know, they, they may have had their wings changed, they may have had new tips, a rudder, an elevator, a replacement set of cowlings. Um, so even the aeroplanes that are very genuine nowadays probably aren't actually as they left the factory. I suppose probably that has always been the hardest bit to establish, even with the drawings that survive and are available. Um, were they the latest mod state? You know, what was this, what was that? And working out what their, the original treatments and processes were in the 1930s. But uh, with the information that we've gathered, the tooling that we've managed to get together over the years, you know, anything is possible to do now to either restore or rebuild on any Mark of Spitfire, obviously you know, Mark 1's included. It's in the, suddenly in the last few years it's become really really hard to find a starter project. There are very very few left now and it will need a major discovery of a quantity of them in some hidden jungle location or whatever um, to kickstart it. But you know it's amazing how these things do turn up still. It, it, and there might be more in Russia, in the uh, Australian area it's becoming harder and harder now, very hard, which is why people are tempting to rebuild aircraft from really simply data plates. If you compare the technical problems to a frontline fighter squadron, tornado squadron, where they have, largely speaking, everything that they need in terms of spares on the rack, it doesn't necessarily follow that we can do the same thing. Their operation is Largely speaking, they identify a fault, they change the black box, and it's solved. There are no black boxes in any of the aeroplanes which we have, and the spares are obviously rare, desirable, and can only be got on a sort of who you know, who you're prepared to exchange with basis, or can you manufacture them, did the Air Force have the foresight to store them in the first place, and that sort of thing. And it is really it's pure engineering rather than what front lines largely become in terms of technical replacement. Components can be, re as long as they pass all the sort of the safety criteria that we have to adhere to. I mean, they'll be thoroughly stripped, cleaned, inspected, and then they'll go off uh, if they have to for any other sort of non-destructive tests, sort of magnetic particle, x-ray, whatever, um, before they're sort of given a ticket to say that they're, they're, they're airworthy again. Well, the one thing about it, because of the regulation 
and the complexity of the aircraft, it is an extraordinarily expensive thing to do. And the cost of restoring a Spitfire now has to be in the million pound um, region. And I'm talking about remanufacturing, not cleaning up old stuff. Um, and I think that will always be the limiting factor. At the length of time it takes to build a fuselage now, I guess we hopefully got it down to around about a year, uh, but it obviously does depend on the start point. Um, having said that, I mean, if a fuselage comes to us as a complete item already, it still has to be stripped, cleaned, inspected, you know, even if everything is going back together and it ends up being 99% what came in the door. Um, but if we're building one um, from what is now accepted, I guess, as being a, a starter project kit, which would be sort of, you know, a few large boxes of parts. Um, by the time we've actually restored what we start with and then filled in the gaps, so to speak, um, it's probably somewhere then between 12 to 14, 12 to 16 months. You can always repair airframes, that is, you know, the basic wings, fuselage, all the rest of it. You can indeed buy Spitfire main, uh, main spars for the wings straight off the shelf because there is you know, a flourishing market in civil Spitfires. What will eventually ground it is when you can no longer refurbish the engines because there are no acceptable replacements and these have now gone in excess of 50 years and you obviously can't go on forever. So that will probably be the final demise but that is actually, we think, a fair way off in the future. Well, it's relatively easy at the moment. Um, there's a plentiful supply of engine and, spa and, and spares for the uh, spares. The, uh, there's an industry has grown up remanufacturing parts. There are shortages which are becoming quite worrying. I mean, brake bags, for example, of no one's making them at the moment, and no one seems to know how to make them. Although there are people trying, so there are one or two areas of concern. Um, tyres at the moment, because the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight have a large need for tyres, uh, Dunlops will still make them. Um, but I've, I do believe that um, you know that's an area to watch and I keep a hefty stock in my cellar. Um, other areas, the propeller blades are made in Germany, um, which is a bit perverse, but that's the way it is. Um, uh, no, it's a relative because of the large number that have been restored, the large number that people want to restore, there is an industry that's pretty well supporting it. Once we've actually got a project to start um, and we've had delivered the remnants of the aeroplane, then we'll go through the obvious gaps. Um, in this particular case, we're doing some frames for a Mark V for a customer of ours in Yorkshire. Um, and we've just done the blanks for the bare frames. This is one of the blanks um, water knifed out to one of our templates. It's just a flat sheet at the moment, as you can see. Um, and here's one that's actually in the first stage of being formed on, on the block, um, which Jake's just sort of done the flange and he's just finishing right now. This is a very original wing. Uh, there's very little new structure was necessary on it. It was in fairly good order, um, although it actually came back from India and the Indians at some time had actually lit a bonfire on the skins in the middle of the wing, so we've had to replace some structure around there, which obviously has been affected by the heat. Um, but apart from that, um, they're virtually sort of 95% original, nice set of wings. Our preference is to use current RAF pilots who have got a good grasp of tailwheel aeroplanes. Um, for several reasons. First of all, they're used to dealing with uh, high speed situations and the Spitfire is far faster than the Cessna 172 that you've learned to fly in. And the, the Spitfire is relatively easy to fly. The problem arises when something goes wrong and an RAF pilot is trained continuously to deal with emergencies all the time. And so often the accidents that have happened in the past are due to amateur pilots either trying to save the aeroplane or being unable to deal with an emergency like an engine failure at low altitude and they try and save the aeroplane and the RAF pilots are drilled over and over again to save themselves and not the aeroplane and uh, that of course is the criteria um, it's instinctive to them 
and we have a preference to, to using RAF pilots. We get no shortage of volunteers and people wanting to fly Spitfires, obviously. It's probably fair to say that new pilots coming here are in no way prepared for the shock of just what they've got under their control. And I say that because you've got to go back to what they're used to, which is a modern jet, which amongst all the technicalities which make it fly, you've got all the luxuries as well, like it's air conditioned. Few people realise just what a terrible cockpit environment a Hurricane or a Spitfire represents. I mean, there is there is no air conditioning or heating whatsoever. And of course, by Sod's law, in the winter, it's freezing cold. In the summer, it's boiling hot. If you take the expedient of opening the canopy, then you let in carbon monoxide and noise. It's not actually fresh air. There is nowhere in either aeroplane where you can actually stick a map. You know, it really is down to the level of just how awful it must have been to have done that job for real. And the noise level is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, what it was like then, I don't know, because they did it in leather helmets. We do it in the most modern, you know, the best, uh, the best you can get in terms of modern helmets, and it is still, at times, quite difficult to tell what is going on outside. So I think, more than anything else, they come down a little bit shell-shocked as to just what environment they've got themselves into. But of course, fairly rapidly after that, then the love affair starts. It is a serious aeroplane and it's got to be taken seriously. And I think the responsibility of keepers, let's not call them owners because it's, a, as you say, it's a transient stage, um, have an enormous responsibility to take it seriously and keep it safe. We're very fortunate, uh, our, our aircraft are based at Duxford and there is an operator at Duxford who's got a two-seater Spitfire and he's uh, as obsessed, obsessed as I am with safety and training and makes his aircraft available as a two-seater to allow people to fly it and, and also his particular two-seater trainer, um, the, uh, the training captain if you like can take the rear seat, so straight off the, the, the trainee can be in the front seat. But to get to that stage you had to go through a number of other aircraft and you had to have, um, I mean our favourite trainer is the Chipmunk because it's, it's handling and circuit pattern for landing is, is similar to a Spitfire on a lot of, it, lot of um, to a high degree and it is also used by the Battle Memorial Flight for training. The Harvard people think is, must be the ideal aeroplane, but not really. Apart from the undercarriage, retractable undercarriage, of course, the Chipmunk doesn't have, um, and the variable pitch propeller, it's actually nothing like a Spitfire to fly. The Chipmunk is far nearer that. But we want to see a lot of hours in Chipmunks, um, some in, in Harvards, and of course, ultimately, the two-seater Spitfire. People are entertained more by things with which there is a direct human contact. Now, by that I mean that if you fly in a tornado, you are largely a systems manager. The aeroplane can actually fly itself better than you can. And I would actually put it down to that, that the aeroplanes look good. I mean, there is for my money, certainly nothing that looks better than a Spitfire. And I think people relate to the, to the sort of human interface with those machines where you do everything for yourself. I mean, you navigate it, you fly it. Uh, if it was war, then you do all that all on your own. And I think it is that element of it which people find so attractive. And I know it must be very disappointing to turn up at a display in a 40 million quid jet and nobody wants to look at it because they want to look at a Spitfire. It is everyone's favourite aeroplane in, at air show. There's no question about it. I mean, we do air shows up and down the country, and although we've got other aircraft and Hurricane and a few other things, 
it's always the Spitfire that everyone wants. And whenever the Spitfire flies, you hear more camera uh, shutters clicking. You hear, uh, uh, you hear less people talking. It is the Spitfire, without doubt. That, and I think it will remain like that for the, forever. I really don't think it will change. It is an iconic aeroplane. I think one of the most important things is people do like to photograph the aeroplane. Um, and when you look along the crowd lines, any display, you'll see more camera lenses than eyes almost. And so it's quite important to have, as part of the display, um, shots uh, of the aircraft flying along the crowd line so people can photograph a top view of it. Um, that's one aspect of it. It's got, uh, what else? Dear, dear, it's very difficult because although I'm not a great lover of low-level aerobatics, um, there are elements of a display that show the Spitfire to its best. And one that we developed at a fairly early stage was with our pilot, Charlie Brown, who's one of the top display pilots. Um, he would approach the venue silently, absolutely head-on, and no one would hear him come because um, or until the very last moment he'd come towards the crowd and then go straight up in front so you see that lovely profile underneath the aircraft and you know you hear people say wow all the time that happens and it's um, but, but you know you need to be immensely experienced and absolutely sure of what you're doing to display an aircraft like that and other people have got their own views, but a, a gentle series of loops and of course that final victory roll as the aircraft disappears is quite important. At a good height, mind you, because we don't like low level um, barrel rolls at all and aileron rolls as well um, have to be at a good height. It's, it's quite tricky designing a display. It depends on the venue as well, of course, because some are straight and long, some are narrow and in, or they may have a curved um, display line so you have to pretty much judge the venue first and then, then build a display on it bearing the criteria of the, 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 the photography and the profile of the Spitfire that you want to, to show. I don't think Mitchell really envisaged the tremendous numbers that were going to be involved. I mean, after all, Supermarine, quite a small organisation when he was in it and when he died, and, and uh, it was basically making flying boats, and it had made one fighter aeroplane, or two fighter aeroplanes, one of which was no good. Um, and I don't think that he, at that time, um, envisage the fact that there was going to be a war and there were going to be tens of thousands of them made. But I, I, yes, I think that he was the sort of person who would have developed along with the aircraft um, right through its, through, through its history. A lot of people I know say, well, you know, as soon as you put a Griffin in, it's not a Spitfire anymore. Well, that frankly is not so because the, yes, the nose grows by four feet which actually, in aesthetic terms, in my, to my mind, actually makes it a more attractive looking aeroplane. The entire fuselage and fin and rudder are absolutely pure Spitfire. I mean, if you can look at it, there's nothing else like it at all. But more importantly than anything else, the wing never changes. The wing remains that absolutely pure ellipse that it always was. So now, I'd, I see what they say, that just as I believe that at about the Mark V or the IX, you run out of the concept of an armed sport plane, which is clearly good fun, and you run into the absolute warbird, which is not quite as much fun. They are all absolutely Spitfires. Well, looking into the future uh, from a time in the Battle of Britain, 
I didn't realize I was part of history. Uh, I was just someone trying to do my little bit and survive. And, uh, and that was it. The bigger picture didn't exist.